Hi there, my name is Philip Heidson. I want to welcome you to the Art of Procurement podcast, the podcast that helps you, a forward-thinking procurement professional, position yourself and your team to proactively take advantage of the revolution that's taking place in procurement today. By interviewing industry trailblazers and sharing insights from our own experiences, my team and I pull back the curtain and shine a light on the strategies, tactics, and tools that procurement teams are using to elevate their impact. This week on the podcast, I'm excited to share a fascinating conversation from our recent Digital Outcomes event. Kelly was joined in our keynote session by Heather Murray. Heather's the founder of AI for Non-Techies and director at Beasting Digital with a discussion on the potential for AI in procurement and how procurement leaders and businesses in general should be approaching, creating and sustaining their AI strategies in a world where the technology is evolving at breakneck speed. Now, Heather also reveals what most people get wrong about AI, which is really interesting, and the inherent risk that everyone in procurement should know about before using it. Heather shares a specific framework that she's developed for teams to decide whether AI is a suitable solution to their business problem. So with that said, let's go straight into the conversation. I'm going to be joined by Heather Murray. She's the director at Beasting Digital. And in that role, she offers AI coaching and training for non-techies. So our focus of this very first session, I think it's a great place to start, is sort of straight talk, no buzz, no nonsense about the potential for AI in business and more specifically within procurement. Um, And we were joking backstage, Heather, before we got started today, that there's been so much general buzz around AI that we're all sort of in this situation where we're thinking, okay, I'm being asked about it. I'm interested in it. We're maybe talking about it a little bit, but I know there's so much I don't know. And so I'm thrilled, given that this is your area of specialty, to have you with us to kick off Digital Outcomes. Thank you very much for having me. And I think those foundations of AI knowledge can really empower people. I think that's where a lot of people are. They, they've they dabbled, but they're not entirely sure what AI actually is and how they can use yeah. it in their everyday work. So my thing is about, you know, AI for non-techies. I don't use any technical terms. I don't use any <laughs> jargon. Um, a lot of people will be relieved to hear I'm not from a technical background. I'm an agency owner. Um, so, yeah, I, I'll happily take you through um, some foundations of AI and how, how it can be used in procurement. I love that. Let's let the stage with a judgment-free zone, right? Yeah. Um, now, you mentioned that you don't necessarily come from a tech background. I'd love to get a little bit of context on how you found yourself being focused on that. What was sort of your professional path that brought you to this moment where you're helping those of us who are not quite so techy figure out how to deal with AI at work? Oh, absolutely. So around about two years ago, I was presented with um, a job for Centrica. So in my capacity as an agency owner, uh, we had a really big contract come up and um, they wanted to understand a little bit more about their their audience. So they had a 10 million pound product that they were selling. And there's only 40 uh, companies in the whole world that could afford it and had very, very specific contacts at those companies. And no matter how many doors they knocked, they just weren't being opened and they really struggled and I looked at what they were doing and thought, I thought it was really broad, the way they were segmenting um, their audience down. There was nothing personal about what they were doing. So I started to look at all the different options available. Um, and I came across something called Crystal Nose, which was actually, there are, there are more newer versions of this technology now, but this was two years ago, which is a lifetime in AI. And it was <laughs> a hyper-personalization tool. So it collected all of your all of the digital breadcrumbs, they're called, all of these little facts about a person from all over the internet, pulled it all together and created this playbook, a personality analysis using DISC um, and lots of different other facts about them, the language that they'll respond to, how to email them. And it was like a book of absolute gold for us. It was incredible. And off the back of that, we raised, um, well, we got 75 million pounds worth of pipeline for them, which equated into, I think it was 30 million pounds worth of sales in the end. So they were really happy. We were really happy as a small agency and my love for AI was then born. (laughs) I think skip forward to November, 2022, when ChatGPT came out, and I thought, absolutely incredible. Um, this is something, this conversational AI, you no longer have to be a technical person to do all these incredible things. And it made me very excited. So I immersed myself for 
quite literally three hours a day, every single day, including Christmas Day. <laughs> my partner oh, was, my gosh. <laughs> I just became obsessed. I'm a little bit like that. Um, and I just taught myself as much as I possibly could and decided yeah. to share what I've learned along the way. And it's just it's snowballed since then. Well, and we're certainly glad to be benefiting from that. One of the comments you made actually is interesting to me, and I want to ask you more about it. You said that two years is an eternity in the world of AI. Can you give us a sense of pace? I mean, I realize it's not like, okay, well, this is the 2024 AI, and then we're going to have the 2025. How should we think about the pace at which things are changing, just so that we know if this is somewhat peripheral to your role, is -hmm. this a weekly thing we should be looking at, quarterly, annually. How, how do you generally talk about the rate of change? It, uh, it really depends on the type of AI you're using. So AI is this very broad umbrella term. And then within that, you have machine learning, which is the ability to use past data to create uh, future strategies. And then deep learning, which is a lot more complex. And that's your kind of chat GPT. Um, and yeah. they use something called neural networks. I said not, I wouldn't use any jargon. And here's me using jargon. <laughs> neural networks based on neurons of the brain. Basically, it can, it can uh, understand a lot of data. But it really depends what your use case is. So if you're using okay. it to, um, I think when it, in, in procurement, say if you, you wanted to analyze a contract and to flag up risks for you, that type of technology within AI hasn't been moving as quickly as something like video generation. So okay. kind of content creation tech is moving very quickly. And that is quite literally week on week, I would say to check in with that weekly, we'll keep you ahead. But with the, I think more in, in this area of procurement, probably checking in once a month, having, you know, working with innovators around you who actually really enjoy that type of thing and having really good credible sources. You know, there are there are podcasts, there are um, YouTube channels that if you sit down and you watch them, you will be up to date at the end. Um, so, yeah, I would say it's not moving quite as fast for your everyday um, use cases within procurement, but you know, month on month is still pretty fast compared to you know technological yeah. advancements that we're used to at the moment. Yeah. Now, do you find that it's progressing and advancing faster on the consumer side than it is the enterprise side, or is it early days enough that everybody is kind of learning from each other and moving forward together? I think there's very little difference between the enterprise side and the consumer mm. side at the moment. I think I, I've, I've been working. So you'd imagine there'd be a, this huge difference. And there is maybe for, for, for some companies that are really far ahead, bigger enterprises that have gone AI first and, and developed their own tools already. But the vast majority of people, and I've worked with some big name, <laughs> big name enterprises, mm. and they are in exactly the same position as small agencies with two or three people everybody's sitting there thinking, what, how do I get started with this? I need to understand yeah. enough to be able to talk in a meeting about it and understand what people are talking about, then understand what it can do just on a basic level and then start to think about what it can do for me. Uh, so what can yeah. it do first and then what can it do for me? How can I get my pains and solve them using AI? What's it good at? What's it bad at? I think um, there isn't much difference at the moment. Everybody's in this same place. It's a bit of a level playing field. And that's actually really exciting for new news for procurement in particular, because mm-hmm. we sort of came to this point with enterprise buying software where everybody was coming to us in the organization and saying, but I use Amazon at home, right? Yeah. And yeah. that's so easy and that's so intuitive. Why am I needing to be trained on this cumbersome thing? And we almost needed to get to a point of deliberate cross product or collaboration where we said, okay, from an experiential point or a training point, what can we learn from some of these consumer facing things? So maybe we've learned our lesson from that and are now getting the opportunity to all evolve together. Yes. Um, now, one of the other things I'd be interested to know is, are there any common misconceptions that people tend to have about AI? If you're just picking up little peripheral snips of information here and there, it's not part of your professional focus. Are there some common things that you find that either people don't know or that there are sort of, uh, I don't know, just misunderstandings out there about the technology? Yeah, absolutely. I think there's there's a few of them, but I think one of the main ones is that it's a one-click solution. So people are imagining we're going to buy this tool, invest in the t- t- and you press one button and you get everything you need out of it. And it's not the case. I think so many people expect that. They, they try it and they press it and they go, oh, 
the result isn't very good. This isn't what I expected. It's supposed to be magic. <laughs> yeah, it's supposed to be magic. And I think some tools yeah. feel like magic at first, but when you actually use them practically, they're not. You need, you still need that human element to it. So yeah. I think with, with AI tools, first of all, it, it, it augments talent that pre, pre-exists. It amplifies real talent. So you have to have AI tools in the hands of somebody who knows what good looks like in the first place. So you need to be able to, dis- to describe accurately what you want and then recognize that the other side, once you've done your prompting or your input or you press your buttons, whether is yeah. whether that is good. So recognize what good looks like at the other side as well. Um, often AI will take you 60 or 70% of the way. And that is the beauty of it. It's, it's going to save you time. It's going to optimize your processes, but it's not going to do everything for you. So if you're mm. expecting to invest in a tool and you can, and this is another big misconception is that you can replace people with it. You'd be really, really sorely mistaken. And I think a few businesses have made that mistake recently okay. with going into thinking they can create, uh, recreate entire teams using AI. We might be able to in future. We certainly can't yet. Yeah. Now, one of the things that procurement is always thinking about, but I think we're especially sensitive to after the last few years is any risk that something new opens us up to. I mean, risk Mm -hmm. has always been part of our purview, uh, Mm -hmm. but with the supply chain disruptions and and things that we've gone through over the last years, it it does stand to reason that we should be looking at this and saying, okay, for all the potential and all the excitement, are there any things that we should be concerned about? And I know you've been collaborating with a lawyer who specializes in technology And so I'd be interested to hear some of what you've learned and seen about maybe AI-related legal implications, just some of those things that either questions procurement should be asking, things we should be thinking about from a contractual or risk aversion standpoint. Where does some of that come into the process? I think there's there's, there's some huge risks uh, legally. I think first one is intellectual property. So if it's with with AI, uh, it's trained on data, uh, other people's data. It does not have original thought. So it's getting yeah. uh, billions and billions of other pieces of content, mixing them all around, trying to pull out the right things and giving it back to you. So it's it, who owns that? <laughs> who owns that? <laughs> and particularly when it comes to kind of yeah. generative AI, when we're talking about text being generated or images being generated, there's no there's no clear answer quite yet. There's a lot of court cases in the pipeline trying to trying to get through and trying to create an answer. Oh, interesting. But intellectual property is definitely a huge one because, you know, if you create something, if you create a contract, do you truly, you know, some, something completely using AI, do you, com- do you completely own that or not? Um, I think data protection is another big one too. So few people know when you start to use these off the shelf products, a lot of these companies we've never heard of before as well. So they've just come to market really quickly. Some of them are just people sat in their offices and you know, in their home office Absolutely. and they've just built this product and they've gone, okay, let's get this to market and it's out and everybody's really excited. And they've, you know, I spoke to um, Hey Gem, one of the biggest AI tools recently, and they started off really small and they snowballed really quickly and they thought, oh my God, um, so these these tools have come to market very quickly. So can we trust them with our data? So they might say your data is private, is it? And also being aware that actually with a lot of tools, I say ChatGPT, I keep on using an example, but it is a good all rounder, that when yeah. you put something into ChatGPT, it is used to train that system. So it's everything you put in, everything you upload is then on the system and can technically, it's not likely to, but it can actually mm. come out somewhere else. So being aware of that, I think trusting um sort of bigger brands this is where bigger brands will will win i think there's there are a lot of sort of when it comes to enterprise versus kind of smaller smaller tools you're going to trust those enterprise names a lot more they're a lot slower and a lot less innovative but they've got that trust factor that if they say your data is going to be treated well then it probably will be we hope um so that's another big factor um i think employment law is something that came up quite a lot as well so um, you know, job displacement, it will, you know, if you have sure. three people, you know, I'll say it's not, I'm saying it won't replace people, but if you do have coasters that aren't actually contributing in any particular way, it's going to start to illuminate those people as well. Yeah. So when it comes to employment law, you know, something we spoke about, it was mainly UK based, what we spoke about, but how is that going to affect your employees and their rights? Um, and then contract law is another one that just, I thought would be quite an interesting one, um, particularly here. So if AI is creating the content and the contract and then AI is reading the contract 
how is that a legal contract at the end? Because nobody has understood it. So nobody has digested yeah. it. So I think that's, there's so many different risks to think about. There's probably another 10 more, but they're the main ones that I thought would probably be most relevant for today. Well, and it does seem interesting. And I know every organization has sort of their own timeline. Some companies are already doing controlled pilots. Some companies have bits of AI that are sort of baked into other proven tools that they've been using. But mm -hmm. it does seem like, Largely, this should be a time for thinking and learning. I find it interesting, even that in talking about something that's so tech based, that we're talking about trust. Mm. Uh, it's very human. I mean, machines can validate, they can check, they can audit, but trust is sort of uniquely human because it suggests that there's a little something beyond the fact. When procurement starts to approach AI and so, okay, we've, we've learned some basics. We can have a decent conversation, ask some questions. What would you suggest around the thought process or the mindset? If we're approaching either an opportunity where we're saying, okay, we're going to evaluate this to see if it's an appropriate place to incorporate AI in our tech stack. Or if we're faced with a problem, we just said, okay, is AI a potential solution for this problem? Beyond the technology, how should we be thinking about those situations? Absolutely. So there's a framework that I've um, I've written, which I think will be quite useful. And I can send it to you afterwards to send out to uh, attendees. Awesome. It might be quite useful. So the first step is to identify the problems. So start with your pains and challenges. So look at your processes and where are the weak points? So I think lots of people are really are taking it the wrong way. So they see thousands of shiny tools you'll get an email through and it promises the world i think there's an awful lot of really good copywriting going on on these landing pages for ai tools as well they all sound <laughs> incredible so there's a lot of ai overwhelm as well so if you start if you start with the tool you're going to get quickly overwhelmed so i would recommend starting first of all with the pain um, and gather feedback mm -hmm. ask your stakeholders you know what they think as well so start with that problem and then you, you have a list of your problems and think right okay then set your goals as well. So what would you like to achieve with AI? You know, it's not capable of doing everything. So you need to align your use of AI with your actual strategy as well and your, your goals within your role and, and as a business as well. Otherwise, it can kind of veer off into its own thing and not really function in an optimal way. Um, and then assessing your AI readiness is another thing as well. So data is absolutely crucial to all of this um your data needs to be structured it needs to be clean it needs to be relevant and um for big enterprises to get ai ready data is the very first place that you need to start because ai is you know you put your data into ai the better the data that goes in the better the results that you get so you can have all of these you know if you if you have all of this past data that's really re relevant and really strong you can make really strong decisions data backed decisions in a way in a conversational way without ever needing a data scientist apart from maybe to, to, to clean your data in the first place um, and then evaluating your tech, tech infrastructure as well, just making sure that what you've got can actually support what you're going to be using. So that's something I think people are making a bit of a, um, have made a few mistakes with, because we, if we were talking with legacy systems, using legacy systems, then um, some, it may not support what AI is. So you, there's a lot of AI first tools, and then there's tools that are integrating AI, and the efficacy of the, to the existing tools that are integrating AI isn't, are not as strong as those that are AI first. They're really not. There's pros and cons to both. As I said, that brand trust is a massive sure. pro. Um, but it might not be set up in the correct way. So just evaluate that. And then looking for those quick wins as well. So the, my, you know, in my agency, I integrated into everything, but it was just one tool. For me, it was recording our, uh, our, our calls. So I had a call, a note taker in there, AI note taker, okay. and that produced transcripts and those transcripts led to me being able to investigate pains and see new sales opportunities. And it was just a useful, really accurate um, recording of what had happened. And also some of them had analyzed body language as well, which is great for, for analyzing sales pitches and oh, yeah. client calls and supply calls and all of that sort of stuff. It's yeah, really useful. So try look for those quick wins in that little tool that could solve that little pain to feel what it, it's like to integrate AI. And then of course, um, Cultivating that um, innovation too is really important. So change management is 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 huge here. You know, people are fearful for their jobs. They're scared. Yes. Um, 
they're very resistant. Um, a lot of people are very cynical about AI. I've been, I get told many times a week that it's a fad, it's a passing fad. And I think oh, it's absolutely not. It's definitely not <laughs> going into it. But and there's a lot of angry people as well. I'm, I'm on LinkedIn a lot talking about AI, trying to be helpful. But I do get a lot of people coming back going, how dare you bring this in? And you're trying to encourage people to be replaced by robots. Mm. And there's just a lot of misinformation. But so I think change management and finding those innovators, those people that are interested in this naturally is really important too for kind of AI task forces. And then implementation and monitoring. So beginning with pilot projects, test and learn with those small projects as you would with anything else um, and track the performance of it as well. So yeah. going through those steps, I think is a, a, a good way to start. So the main thing is beginning with the problem and not with the tool. Yeah, well, it's interesting. You talk about the copywriting on some of the tool sites. I would love to know, I guess I still consider myself a writer, how much of that copy was written by AI and how much of it was written by people? We'll, we'll never know the answer, but it certainly does make everything sound fairly glowy. I think that's where a lot of those, on the one hand, magical expectations come from, and on the other hand, worries about the robots are coming to take our jobs. Uh, yeah. In fact, I was just recently talking to a procurement executive who was talking about maybe doing some early pilots or testing some platforms that have AI. And he was talking about the challenge associated with figuring out what's hype and what's real, because mm -hmm. everything sounds good. And especially if we only know so much based on first exper firsthand experience, um, are there any, you know, we, we made this a judgment free zone. We said no buzzwords. Are there any tips you can offer? You know, what's something that might suggest maybe a product isn't 100% baked or what's something a little bit buzzwordy? Are there any ways from websites especially that we can start to separate what's tested, what's proven, what's hopeful, what's hype, so that as we go in, we've sort of pre-narrowed down our pool of options to things that are actually viable should we decide to test them? So I would absolutely love to be able to give a, a straight answer here and a list of things to look for, but it, it is all so new, it's really difficult to do that. It's a real, real problem. There are no trust sites. There are no review sites that are valid. Uh, there's something called There's an AI for that, which has a review facility, but nobody's okay. really using it. And it's, it's a good place to find new tools, but that would be starting with the tool and not the pain. So <laughs> um, <laughs> if you are looking around for something specific, it's a good place to find things. But I have found that the, re the review facility on there isn't very strong. I think it's one of the biggest problems that's out there at the moment is not being able to see, you know, as I say, I, I, first of all, I would say those that landing page copy for those tools is definitely human. AI is, is not good at, not that good at <laughs> copywriting yet. <laughs> um, Hooray! <laughs> But I think demos, it's got to be demos. So mm. actually looking at what it does, um, word of mouth is going to be huge as well. I I keep, and it, because of this big problem, I keep a very straightforward spreadsheet and a call sort of, um, I, you must remember as well with these tools. So they're just, they're coming out to market really quickly, but they might be incredible in a few months time because it's moving so quickly. True. So I have this thing. So if I if I go onto it and I can see that it's you can see almost you see very quickly whether it's whether it's going to be useful or not. So if it's decent, I will keep it and think right. Okay, I might go go forward and give that a proper trial. If it has potential, I'll review it again in a few months' time. So I keep it there because sometimes it might have a glitch, but people are working very quickly to improve glitches now. It's not as things aren't as they used to be. Whenever there was. Whenever there's a problem on something like ChatGPT, it's fixed with 10 brand new features within a couple of weeks. So being aware of that is really important. So don't be put off by, by glitches. But there are some really talented people that might not present themselves as well as some of the big brands, but they've got much better products. So unfortunately, I'm not able to give you a very straight answer with that one other than try speak to people um and watch those demos what because that they're all doing demos that's something they all do and just check that that's relevant and their customer service is really good because they're all trying to outdo each other as well so make the most of that sorry yeah. it's not a better answer no but but i think it's a fair answer right and and that's where we are that the challenge becomes and this is something procurement is very familiar with not necessarily in the sense of artificial intelligence but we're always sort of on the smell test team, right? You know, okay, are these claims that sort of sound too good to be true, really too good to be true? Is there a way we can get a sample? Is there a way we can get a demo or, or tour a facility? 
Are most people at this point working with third parties or have you had any contact, especially with really large companies that are sort of testing, should we build our own versus should we go out of house? Um, Is it a predominantly a third party market now or is there really any in-house experimentation going on? I think that there's a lot, of, particularly I've worked with a lot of big law firms and they're doing a bit of experimentation, but I've found that okay. they've, they've run before they can walk with, with, with it. So they've custom built at great expense their own yeah. AI tools before knowing what they really want. So they've done the tool before the, the pain problem, the pain situation. So I think starting with those off the shelf third party tools is absolutely the best yeah. way to go. So you can, again, finding out about AI's capabilities is really important. And then when you find it, because all these tools have limitations. So learning something, and and this is what I've been in because I, I use probably 10, I've tried hundreds, but I use probably 10 AI tools on a daily basis. I know where their limitations are. I have to, I can, okay. do, I can go to this point over here and I can go to this point over here. But if I wanted to build a custom tool, it would be something that would do this very specific job. So therefore I'd be able to give a much better brief to an AI developer um, okay. saying I wanted to do this specific thing. And here's an example of where it was going up to at this point. So I absolutely think that everybody should be starting with those tools and those that haven't, maybe on have it hasn't worked out too well for them not across the board but the the ones people that I've been speaking to now the other thing I'm I'm interested in and this actually mirrors something else we've already been through in a form and procurement so in the past we went through the shift where everything was originally behind the company's own firewall right on servers and then everything became software as a service and went into the cloud and there was sort of like an uncomfortable teenagey time from a software perspective where you had solutions built to be in the cloud from day one, operating one way, and solutions that had migrated to keep up with things working in another. Have you observed any differences between platforms and solutions that are built now from day one on AI, even if it was rudimentary early AI, versus Mm -hmm. platforms and things that have existed for a long time that are trying now to work and bake AI in? Any observations around how those two situations are working differently? Yeah, well, what ones that I'd say that pre-existing platforms using AI, they've got they can struggle, as I said before, with that sort of legacy um, legacy systems, and they kind of plonk in AI into the top, and it doesn't yeah. quite work. I think there's a lot of tools. I think we saw a big influx of them not that long ago, over the last sort of six months, of people go now with AI, and you go, oh great, and you go on and <laughs> now better tasting. Yeah, that's it. I think yeah. LinkedIn is a really good example. They said, oh, if we'll use AI to rewrite your posts so they're worse. <laughs> I think that's, that's what I was using. There was somebody who absolutely loves LinkedIn. I thought, oh, an AI tool, and it rewrites it in the most terrible way. It's like it doesn't understand itself. It's not being programmed properly. Yeah. And that's a really good example of it not working. They just wanted to do something that had AI because that's the that's the trend. But as I say, they have their user base. They have that trust, which is really, really important when selecting things. So I think as things go, you know, as things progress, you're going to have um, more, you're going to have better AI tools. The thing is, when, when they're bigger companies and they're pre-existing, there's a lot more red tape to them innovating and being flexible. True. Um, so it takes longer for them. You know, some of these advances are happening. The, the things that happened last week in AI were, were mind blowing. And then this week again, we've got new tools. Yeah. If you want to stay ahead with the latest thing, you need to be quick. So these smaller businesses are actually at a massive advantage because they because they can be really flexible and really innovative. And something comes out, a new version of uh, GPT, for example, they can have that on their software. And, and, and that's what people, you know, innovators are, are thinking, you know, I want that very latest version. Um, yeah, so, but with those new AI first companies, there's a massive learning curve as well, isn't there? So they don't have the trust. They do need to get people, you know, you, you're willing to learn with an established big company that's adding AI, but with a new one, it's that, you know, who are you and why should I listen to you? Why should I bother to do your tutorials? And I think yeah. there's kind of pros and cons to both. Yeah. And and I certainly were in some ways, I and mean, I think we saw this as consumers with uh, the development of app stores. I have a feeling we're going to find out in retrospect that a few of these companies were started by 16 year olds in bedrooms and nobody knew. Right. But it's so accessible and and they're so native. Exactly. Um, Heather, one last question for you before we start to wind down our time. We talked a lot about pace and time today. And, you know, you talked about the fact that, you know, depending on your involvement, maybe sort of a monthly check in. What's the latest? What's going on? If we try to take a step back, 
I think a lot of us were really just finding out, especially about generative AI in early 2023. And now we're a couple of months into 2024. Can you give us the very high level, what is sort of the general difference between how AI is impacting business in terms of being piloted, implemented, adopted even in 2023 versus where you think 2024 is likely to go? Absolutely. So I think we 2023 was the year of the dabbler. So um, people dabbled. We all heard about it and we're all intrigued and there is no barrier to us trying it, particularly with, the, again, chat GPT. So we were able to just bring this up and within two seconds we've signed in and we can in, we can interact like a human and that was exciting for us. So we can play around and then that then has this other knock-on effect of, oh, I've got that, that's interesting for now. I'm not sure what, what it can do and what use it is, but it's fun. I'm going to try this other thing. You try this other thing and you think, ah, so we're dabbling around, but we're not actually integrating. Mm -hmm. I think 2024 is the year that we actually integrate and start to create workflows. So instead of using individual tools, people are going to start to learn that tools stacked with each other um, help a lot. So, for example, I talked about um, using an AI note taker. I would record my calls with um, my Sybil, an AI note taker. Then I would use something like Claude, which is a version of ChatGPT. Well, it's, it's not a version of it. It's a similar thing to ChatGPT, sure. but it's better, uh, better for human sounding content. So I would stack those two things together to get the results that I want. And then I might use ChatGPT to, to edit the results. And so using those three ones, so people are going to start to realize the capabilities and the limitations of the main tools that are out there and start to start to integrate. I think this is the year of actually integrating and, and trialing and experimenting. I think that's a really exciting next step. So I've seen people cycle through these processes quickly. They're more innovative, natural innovators. They've done the dabbling. They've, they're kind of in the integration. And the next point is the kind of the stacking after that. Yeah. Well, guilty is charged on the dabbling. I know when yeah. ChatGPT first came out, we spent several weeks at Art of Procurement having our podcast show notes rewritten in the voice of a pirate. That was yes. endlessly <laughs> entertaining for, for yeah. several weeks. But no, now the serious business begins of, okay, we know there's an advantage to be had here. We yeah. just need to figure out how do we preserve the things that need to be human while leveraging the advantages that technology offers us. Um, Heather, you promised us no buzzwords and some straight talk AI. You've definitely delivered. Thank you so much for spending this first session of Digital Outcomes 2024 with us. If this episode struck a chord with you, please do send it to somebody. We grow here at Art of Procurement through word of mouth, and that would be really appreciated. You can also support us by giving us a thumbs up, a star rating, or a review wherever you listen to your podcasts. Since 2015, we've built the world's largest free resource for procurement professionals looking to elevate their impact. Our resources span podcasts like this, videos, blog posts, papers, and events. To join us on the inside and to ensure you never miss an episode, a webinar, an event, or a post, please do subscribe to our weekly newsletter, This Week in Procurement. You can do that at artofprocurement.com slash subscribe. That's artofprocurement.com slash subscribe. Thank you for joining us today, and I look forward to seeing you again soon.